today I just want to tell you that these events of the Russians turning against Russians within Russia <laughs> reminds me of several battles that took place, one in the Bible with Saul and the Philistines, and years and centuries later when British General Edmund Allenby recaptured the holy city of Jerusalem from a 400 year Turkish Ottoman occupation where these people had invaded 400 years earlier and held the Holy Land captive basically until it was liberated by the British General Edmund Allenby and his troops in 1917. So I want to share this series of miracles with you in case you have never heard this before. And the incredible truth is that there were some Christians that were able to pinpoint and they knew before the airplane was even invented they knew that Jerusalem was going to be liberated by some sort of uh, mechanical flying machines. So how was it possible to calculate the exact year of the liberation in 1917? It says, how do we arrive at the year 1917 in Bible prophecy? When making his covenant with the people of Israel, God warned them that if they sinned, they would be corrected, and there would be a seven times punishment. And this is written in Leviticus 26:28 for national apostasy. A time in the Bible is 360 days. Daniel 7.25 and 12.7, Revelation 12.6 and 12.14. In Bible prophecy, a day often means a year. Each day for a year. We see that in Numbers 14.34 and Ezekiel 4.6. Students of Bible prophecy call this the year-slash-day principle. A year of 360 days is known as a prophetic year as distinct from lunar or solar years. There are seven references in the Bible which help us understand the seven times punishment of Leviticus 26:28, Time, times, and the dividing of times, three and a half years in Daniel 7.25. We see times, times, and a half, three and a half years in Daniel 12, 7. Forty and two months, which is three and a half years in Revelation 11, 2. A thousand two hundred and three score days in Revelation 11, 3. A thousand two hundred and three score days in Revelation 12, 6. We see time, times, and half a time, three and a half years, in Revelation 12, 14, and 40 and two months, which is also three and a half years, in Revelation 13, 5. A time is a prophetic year of 360 days, and a day represents a year. The seven times punishment for national apostasy was to last 2,520 years. King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon invaded the apostate kingdom of Judah in the Hebrew month of Kislev, responding to our November-December in the year of 604 BC. Jerusalem surrendered in the middle of December, or Kislev, it was actually early December on our calendar becoming a vassal state. Judah later tried to break free from Babylonian domination, but was invaded and Jerusalem and the temple were destroyed in 586 BC. Then Jesus told us that Jerusalem would be trampled down by the heathen, the Gentiles, until the time of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Leviticus 26:28 tells us, that the punishment for national apostasy was to last 
2,520 years. The prophesied 2,520 years stretched from 604 BC to 1917 AD. A year must be added because the calendar goes from 1 BC to AD 1 without a year zero. Christians saw this prophecy in the Bible well before it was fulfilled, and Admiral Lord Fisher, First Sea Lord, General Allenby, and many other devout Christians were confident that this prophecy would be fulfilled to the letter, and it was. The 70 weeks prophecy of Daniel in 9, 24 through 27 is interpreted using the same prophetic year-day rule with a day representing a year. The 70 weeks, 70 weeks of years prophecy begins in 457 BC with the decree of Artaxerxes to restore and build Jerusalem, Daniel 9.25. The 69th prophetic week ends in A.D. 27 with the baptism of Jesus until Messiah the Prince. In the midst of the 70th week, A.D. 31, shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And at the end of the 70th week, A.D. 34, Stephen the proto-martyr was stoned signaling the final rejection of the messiahship of Jesus by the Jewish authorities that we see in Acts 7, 58-8-4, and ultimately resulting in the destruction of Jerusalem by the Romans in A.D. 70. Yet hundreds of Bible prophecies have been fulfilled to the letter and still many Christians have no interest in them or will even doubt or dispute this um, information that's being shared with you. So I'm going to share more of these excerpts of the liberation of the Holy City. And this was Jerusalem, December 1917. Um, General Allenby dismounted his horse in humility, removed his hat in reverence, and entered the walls of the old city through the Jaffa Gate, which hadn't been in use for many years. 973 years of Muslim rule were over. Iconic footage shows Jewish people welcoming him as if he was some kind of messiah, and the land was never the same again. As time went on, Britain's involvement would not always be so positive, but the story of how this particular moment came about is one of breathtaking wonder. So I'm going to read you several excerpts. This one is one for Israel. After other Muslim conquests had come and gone, the Turkish Ottomans conquered and ruled over Jerusalem and what was then Palestine for 400 years. In the Bible, 400 years seems to be a bit of a byword for slavery and oppression. 400 years of Canaanite sin stored up for wrath. 400 years of slavery in Egypt. And here we have 400 years of Ottoman Turkish rule of the Muslim Empire. The building of churches and synagogues was outlawed. Church bills were forbidden. Non-Muslims did not have equal rights for the vast majority of that time and had to pay the additional jizya tax, which is an Islamic tax imposed upon the so-called non-believers of the Islamic faith. But most catastrophically of all, in 1915, the call had gone out to get rid of every Christian in the empire. The Armenian genocide included not only Armenians, but also Catholics and Greek Orthodox Christians. One and a half million people were murdered, and many more suffered horrifically before making their escape. Perhaps God had decided that enough was enough. The moment was foretold and the strategy given in Isaiah 31. 
As the Turks were allied with Germany in the First World War, the British found themselves fighting against the fading Ottoman Empire in the Middle East. British General Allenby was charged with liberating Jerusalem and had expressed concern to his superiors about the magnitude and sensitivity of the task before him. He had been ordered to take the city without firing on the people or the city. How on earth was it to be done? Pray, the answer came from above, which perhaps did not seem to be very helpful at the time. But Allen B. did pray because he was a very faithful Christian. He came across the work of Bible scholar Dr. H. Aldersmith, who had been studying the prophecies regarding Israel. Now this was before Israel became a nation that this Christian man had been studying the prophecies. Alder Smith explained in his book from 1898 called The Fullness of the Nations that he believed Jerusalem would be delivered by Great Britain in 1917. He had become convinced from Isaiah 31, 4 through 5, that the UK would have a part to play in the restoration of Jerusalem and that it would be accomplished by some kind of flying machine. Aldersmith had arrived at this idea even before the Wright brothers took their first flight in an airplane in 1907. Airplanes had not even been invented. But of course, that is precisely what ended up happening. Fourteen years later, in 1917, airplanes were used but not commonly, and most people had never seen one. This man's conviction about Isaiah 31 was Allenby's inspiration. He would fly planes over Jerusalem and drop notes written in Arabic saying, Surrender the city, Allenby. Ironically, there had been an Arab saying that the Turks will not leave Jerusalem until the river Nile flows into Palestine and the prophet expels them from the city. Remarkably enough, events conspired to bring these two highly unlikely things to pass. British troops were stationed in Egypt in the years leading up to these events and Lieutenant General Sir Archibald Murray gained authorization to build a pipeline to pump fresh Nile water and a railway to supply their troops. By 1917 the water had arrived along with the troops in Palestine. The River Nile was bizarrely flowing in Palestine. And when I just read that the chills just ran all the way down. Wow. Now right there I'm gonna backtrack and read another excerpt that fills in some of the space there. The Turkish Ottoman Empire had control of Jerusalem. The British were planning on taking over in preparation and defense of this invasion. The Turks planned to seal up all the gates to the city and blast open the Eastern Gate, which is the Golden Gate, the Gate of Mercy, in order to create a fortified secret supply line entrance that would come down into Jerusalem from the Kidron Valley and up through the Eastern Gate. In order to create this supply line, they would have to blow open the sealed Eastern Golden Gate and break an ancient biblical prophecy, which is in Isaiah 44, 1 through 2. Then he brought me back to the outer gate of the sanctuary, which faces to the east, but it was shut. And the Lord said to me, This gate shall be shut, it shall not be opened, and no man shall enter by it, because the Lord God of Israel has entered by it. Therefore it shall be shut. The Turks that were commissioned with this task were captured and stopped just hours before the bomb would have been ignited. In the meantime, General Edmund Allenby and his British troops were getting into position to apprehend Jerusalem. Allenby was known as a Christian and follower of the Bible. It is reported that the night before the invasion, Allenby prayed 
that he might take the city of Jerusalem without destroying the holy places. He had wired London for instructions and had received a scripture verse as a reply, which was, As birds flying, so will the Lord of hosts defend Jerusalem. Defending also, he will deliver it, and passing over, he will preserve it. In Isaiah 31, 5. And there were also in that scripture, there was also scripture about lions and um, young lions. And he saw the lion as Britain, and he saw the young lions as New Zealand and Australia, which is very interesting. He was so excited about this verse that he read it aloud before his troops that were positioned in the foothills of Jerusalem. Allen B. commandeered every available aircraft for a flyover. On the morning of December 10th, what seemed like hundreds of planes skirted low over the Temple Mount. When the planes went up, a cloud covering hid them so that they were not seen. You know that scripture that says they will cover the land like a cloud? Could that be the fulfillment of that already? Okay, so when the planes went up, a cloud covering hid them so that they were not seen. Only their sound was heard. Flyers were dropped that said, Surrender immediately. You don't have a prayer. And were signed by Allenby. What the general did not know was that the Turks believed in the old prophecy that they would never lose the holy city until, quote, a man of Allah came to deliver it. According to reports, the signature of Allen B. on the paper dropped from the sky was interpreted by them to mean the word Allah in Arabic, meaning God, and B, B E H, in Arabic that means son. The Turks were looking at a demand to surrender signed by Allah be, the son of God. <laughs> In response, they hoisted a white flag and surrendered the city without firing a single shot. This was an incredible fulfillment of biblical prophecy which put Israel under British mandate this mandate called the Balfour Declaration called for a Jewish homeland and set the foundation for modern Israel. Jerusalem had been under Muslim control for centuries. So you can see how the Jews would look at this past history, even though things happened during the British uh, occupation and the, you know, the British Empire was ruling there. So you can see how they could look back at these events and see that the British army and the British general were the ones to liberate the Holy Land and Jerusalem exactly in the year that was already determined and foretold in prophecy for the year 1917. And you could see how King Charles III would then be kind of viewed as sort of a messianic figure because you know his ancestors were the monarchs at the time of sending General Allenby and the British forces there to liberate the Holy Land. So in their minds he could be considered a prophetic man that is the anointed one, the king, that would be the one whose ancestors helped to liberate Jerusalem after 400 years. I can see how they... Now another version, an excerpt of this history says that Allen B. was a devout Christian. He often consulted the Bible for spiritual direction on the field of battle. He would sit in his army tent and he would read the Bible at night after they had fought during the daytime. And it was one night when he was sitting in his officer's tent that he read a certain battle that happened with King Saul and he mimicked that battle and he won doing the same thing that his son Jonathan had done in 
I believe it was the book of Samuel. I'll tell you about that in a minute. Okay, so then we have um, what took place the morning of Saturday, December 8th of 1917. The British chaplains that morning led the troops in prayer. The first lesson from morning prayer on that day was from Isaiah 31. The very prophecy that was to be fulfilled on that day was found in that lesson, which says, For thus hath the Lord spoken unto me, like as the lion and the young lion roaring on his prey, when a multitude of shepherds is called forth against him, he will not be afraid of their voice, nor abase himself for the noise of them. So shall the Lord of hosts come down to fight for Mount Zion and for the hill thereof. As birds flying, so will the Lord of hosts defend Jerusalem. Defending also, he will deliver it, and passing over, he will preserve it. Isaiah 31, 4 through 5. That day, December 8, 1917, was also the Feast of Hanukkah, commemorating an earlier deliverance of Jerusalem by Judah Maccabee two centuries before Christ. In the reading from Isaiah, General Allenby saw the lion in the prophecy as representing Great Britain and the young lion as representing the Australian and New Zealand troops which were called the Anzac. When Isaiah spoke prophetically of God defending and delivering and preserving Jerusalem as birds flying, Allenby knew exactly what that meant. By this time, the Royal Flying Corps had complete air supremacy over Palestine, and that morning General Allenby ordered British planes to make reconnaissance flights over Jerusalem and to drop these leaflets calling upon the Turkish garrison to surrender, but were directed not to strafe or bomb the holy city. With all of the British air activity, panic broke out among the garrison, who had no air support to speak of, and the Turkish officers could not get the situation under control. That night, Isbet Bey, the governor of Jerusalem, smashed all of the equipment in the telegraph office and wrote a letter of surrender. At 2 a.m. on December 9th, the Turkish garrison began leaving through the Jaffa Gate, and by 7 a.m., the last of the Turkish soldiers were passing through St. Stephen's Gate, making their way along the Jericho Road. They and a few frightened policemen came out of the city bearing a white flag and surrendered Jerusalem to General O'Shea of the 60th Division. The holy city had been delivered without a single shot being fired. On December 11, 1917, General Edmund Allenby entered Jerusalem silently on foot and without fanfare. No guns were fired in salute. Only the bells of Jerusalem churches rang. Isaiah 35.5 had been fulfilled. As birds flying, so will the Lord of hosts defend Jerusalem. Defending also, he will deliver it, and passing over, he will preserve it. As birds flying, God had used the royal flying corps to frighten the garrison of the Turks into leaving. As foretold, God had delivered the holy city and preserved it. There was no siege. When he dropped these leaflets from the sky, as the royal planes covered the sky like, a, you know, they were hidden in the clouds, and dropped these leaflets, the Turks were looking at a demand to surrender signed by Alaba, the son of God. <laughs> or the prophet of God. In response, they hoisted a white flag and surrendered the city. What I find interesting is that when Kaiser Wilhelm II of Germany visited Jerusalem in 1898, he demanded a bigger entrance for his procession into Jerusalem. And to that end, the Turks blew open a gate. The Kaiser entered as a conquering hero, riding a stallion. According to historians, the Kaiser's grandiose entrance through ceremonial arches on an enormous white horse struck contemporaries as arrogant and posturing. Allenby didn't want to emulate the German ruler. He came out not as a conquering hero, but to free the city from Ottoman rule. 
The general rode a horse from his camp to the Jaffa Gate, but dismounted and walked through it. Allenby described his entrance in a low-key manner. I entered the city officially at noon, December 11th, with a few of my staff. Joining us were the commanders of the French and Italian detachments, the heads of the political missions, and the military attaches of France, Italy, and America. The procession was all afoot at Jaffa Gate. I was received by the guards representing England, Scotland, Ireland, Wales, Australia, New Zealand, India, France, and Italy. The population received me well. It took another year for World War I to end, but the taking of Jerusalem on December 11, 1917, was the beginning. Reportedly, the night before Allen B. entered Jerusalem, he prayed he wanted to know how to quell any violence, particularly to the holy places. When he wired his superiors in London for instructions, they included the verse from Isaiah 31, 5, which was the scripture, As birds flying, so will the Lord of hosts defend Jerusalem. Defending also, he will deliver it, and passing over, he will preserve it. That night he declared martial law and promised every sacred building, monument, holy spot, shrine, traditional site, endowment, pious bequest, or customary place of prayer, or whatsoever form of the three religions will be maintained and protected. In his official report at the time, Allen B. wrote, Guards have been placed over the holy places. My military governor is in contact with the acting custodians and the Latin and Greek representatives. The governor has detailed an officer to supervise the holy places. The Mosque of Omar and the area around it have been placed under Muslim control. A military cordon of Mohammedan officers and Soldiers has been established around the mosque. Orders have been issued that no non-Muslim is to pass within the cordon without permission of the military governor and the Muslim in charge. So, I'm just reading you different versions of the same story to get all the pieces of the story. On the morning of December 11th, General Allenby read the Isaiah passage to his troops. He ordered all available EEF aircraft to fly low over the city, dropping the leaflets. Clouds covered the sky that morning. Jerusalem residents could not see the planes, but they could hear them, and the leaflets read, Surrender immediately. You don't have a prayer, signed Allenby. <laughs> The Remnant website noted the Arabic interpreter who translated the message incorrectly correctly wrote Allen B's name as Allah Bey or the Son of God. According to Cross and Light, an old Turkish prophecy, they would never lose the holy city until a man of Allah came to deliver it. According to the reports, the signature of Allenby on the paper dropped from the sky was interpreted by them to mean the word Allah in Arabic meaning God and Be in Arabic that means son. The Turks were looking at a demand to surrender signed by Allah Be, the son of God. <laughs> in response, they hoisted a white flag and surrendered the city without firing the single shot. I think it's just so incredible that Dr. H. Aldersmith, who had been studying the prophecies regarding Israel, explained in his 1898 book that he believed Jerusalem would be delivered by Great Britain in 1917. And he had become convinced from the very passage that General Allenby later was reading and later was given from London when he you know, made contact to find out how to go about taking the city without firing a single shot, without destroying any of the holy sites. And that was the verse about the planes flying over. And I just think it's really incredible. This is where I left off from. By early the following morning, all had gone, and the mayor of Jerusalem with a small party came under 
a white flag to surrender the keys of the city. That white flag, along with the keys, are on display in the Tower of David Museum today. The formal surrender was accepted by General O'Shea on behalf of the Commander-in-Chief, who himself took the official ceremonial surrender two days later. Jerusalem was delivered and not a shot was fired. Rather remarkably, the motto on the airplanes used in Allen B's operation to deliver Jerusalem was a quote from the Quran, which said, I spread my wings and keep my promise. Wow, I have the chills again. General Allenby officially accepted the surrender at David's Tower by the Jaffa Gate, and a proclamation was read in seven languages telling the people that they could go quietly and undisturbed about their ordinary business and all their holy places would be respected. Now pay careful attention to this date. And it says, So the evening of December 8th through the day of December 9th, was a critical and historical time. In the Jewish calendar from sunset of December 8th through to sunset of December 9th that year fell on the 24th of the Jewish month of Kislev. What is so special about the 24th of Kislev? To find the answer we need to go back many hundreds of years to the prophet Haggai. Kislev is the ninth month of the Jewish calendar, and if we read the second chapter of Haggai, a prophet who was ministering during the building of the second temple, we notice that he highlights that very date three times. Haggai is receiving the word from the Lord on that date, the 24th of Kislev, and tells us to consider that date or pay careful attention to it in verse 10, 18, and again in verse 20. The context of the chapter is mainly surrounding the issue of the temple of holiness and defilement and a blessing for his people. God reminds us of his power over all the nations and his total sovereignty. He can shake the nations whenever he chooses. He promises blessing for the people of Israel and draws our attention quite pointedly to that particular date, the 24th of Kislev, December 24th. But from this day on, writes Haggai, I will bless you, and some believe that the Feast of Dedication, Hanukkah, has its roots in this chapter, since surrounds the issue of rededicating the temple. Perhaps this date was significant to the Jewish people even before the Maccabees overthrew the Greeks and turfed out their idols from the temple in 167 BC. But either way, the idea of removing that which is against the God of Israel from his holy place resonates throughout the ages at this very time in the Jewish calendar. Is it a coincidence that Allenby walked through that gate on the 24th of Kislev at Hanukkah, the Feast of Dedication, signaling the end of Muslim rule over Jerusalem? Moreover, even further back than Haggai, Daniel 12.12 12 also prophesied that there would be blessing for Jerusalem after 1,335 days. As one of the British officers was amazed to realize, the Islamic year in 1917 was 1,335 since the Muslim calendar started in 622. Keen observers of prophecy, such as Dr. H. Aldersmith, had already put the pieces together and were expecting redemption and blessing for Jerusalem in 1917. By December 8th, the Islamic year had just changed to 1,336. The 1,335 years were up. Blessed is he, writes Daniel, who waits and arrives at the 1,335 days. Wow, that is just so powerful. After 1,335 years of Islam, the city of Jerusalem was delivered by the British using airplanes that hovered like birds and the clouds were covering the planes. 
on the 24th of Kislev, 1917, and remarkably in the Standard English Book of Prayer for that day, December 8th, the reading just happened to be Isaiah 31. Whew. So, this is the power of God on the move. In everything that I have shared with you from the Holy Spirit about Jerusalem being mystery Babylon and I showed you the scriptures and I showed you the verse that said I sit a queen and am no widow I will see no mourning which matched to the people of Israel being taken to Babylon and that they were they were the city that was once like a queen was now like a widow and was lamenting and mourning in sackcloth and here she is in Revelation bragging and elevating herself as queen, saying she won't see any mourning because strong is God who judges his people. And think about the fact that the Antichrist is going to sit in that third temple and defile it. Think about the fact that the two witnesses are coming to Jerusalem to give the everlasting gospel message one last time for the people of God to repent that are there in Jerusalem. And they're going to be killed there. And then they're going to be resurrected. And the people are going to be astonished when they see them jump to their feet and then they ascend up in the clouds. So all of this is taking place in Jerusalem because what God is doing is drawing us all back to that place that had been the Garden of Eden. And he's bringing us in the path towards himself to live with him forever. But we have to go through the Messiah, which is Jesus. But those in Jerusalem that have this anti-Christ, anti-gospel, anti-Jesus spirit rejecting their king have, you know, they're going to experience this time of Jacob's trouble, which is their last seven years. So it's all going to take place in Jerusalem, and every bit of everything that has been spread into the other nations that deal with Babylon, it's all going to culminate in Jerusalem. So she's the scarlet harlot, she's the mother of us all, and this is what I revealed to you from the Holy Spirit. If anyone takes away what the Holy Spirit has revealed and tries to apply it to something that's coming out of their own mouth, I would be very careful about that. And that's just a warning because the Holy Spirit's words should not be interpreted wrongly, but proven scripture upon scripture, precept upon precept, not I'm interpreting scripture according to what I think or my own saying or what I think in my head. No, it's the Holy Spirit's words and it all has to do with Jerusalem and coming back to the Garden of Eden. And this is where the Lord is going to descend, destroy the kingdoms of this world, destroy the abominations, the desecration of what is going to happen at the third temple. And he's going to set up his kingdom that will never, ever end. So you can see how the British king, the British monarch, can now be seen as his ancestors are the ones that liberated, after 400 years, Jerusalem. Paving the way for this to come for you know, they're going to set an anointed one on that throne one last time because they're rejecting King Jesus, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And the Lord knew this was going to happen and that they were going to reject him. But he is in control of it all. So when you have the Sanhedrin, and remember this. That Rabbi Berger of King David's tomb, who commissioned the gold crown to give to the Messiah and the Torah scroll to give to the Messiah, when he comes to visit Jerusalem, which means he's not a rabbi in Jerusalem, it means he's coming from outside to visit. And King Charles III, ironically, is the first British monarch that will be coming to visit there as king. And because he was just coronated and there was a lot of Jewish 
participation in the coronation ceremony along with the anointing oil coming from the olives pressed from the Mount of Olives at his anointing from Jerusalem, it all falls into place. So do not buy the lie that America is Mystery Babylon. That is a false interpretation. People that are saying that do not know what they're talking about. What's going to happen, I was going to say that Rabbi Berger is actually a member of the Sanhedrin, okay? So the Sanhedrin wants to elevate their whole group to become the world supreme court and they want to have each representative of each of the 70 nations come sit in that round building with the Sanhedrin with representatives of the 70 nations with a king at the helm at the head of it all the lead monarch of the world so this is where God is going to come down he's going to send the two witnesses to them because they are rejecting the gospel at that time which the ultra-orthodox have already tried to put that bill through but Benjamin Netanyahu stopped it from going through but at some point when they get the Sanhedrin going they will be the ones probably to adopt that bill and when they turn the um, democracy which they've been diminishing into the either the um, parliamentary monarchy with the king and they become members of his commonwealth as they've been thinking about doing which is an article I just happened to locate plus the Palestinians and he makes peace and brokers a peace between the two and the UK just signed a seven-year deal with Israel for trade and tech and climate change agenda and the gender agenda and you know all of the monetary stuff it all comes together and you know this being predicted to be the year 1917 from the sevenfold curse that God gave for apostate Israel and it happened the deliverance on the exact date predicted in prophecy is incredible I do think it's kind of fascinating that Kaiser Wilhelm of Germany the second he rode in on a big giant white stallion and it was after that that World War One and World War Two transpired and people died and perished and uh, a lot of war broke out so now there was another battle with General Allenby where he, I was telling you he was sitting in his tent and he read this scripture of this battle that took place at Mishmash and this was with King Saul against Philistines and God confused the Philistines and they started fighting and battling each other and killing each other so that you know they thought they were surrounded by the entire British army but it was only one garrison that went and they were confused when they heard these sounds and let me just tell you this story it's it's another miracle that happened during this liberation of Jerusalem and this was one of the battles against the Ottoman Turks and this is um, one of the excerpts is from patternsofevidence.com during World War I, a group of British troops arriving in Palestine, today the nation of Israel, purchased Bibles, not necessarily for purposes of prayer, but instead they were used to study the geography. The soldiers saw them as great geographical resources to maneuver about the land. And this was General Allenby's troops. This would prove to be very beneficial to success in battle and World War I victory using the Bible. And I believe that, you know, General Allenby, he was a Christian, and I believe they were using it to pray and to talk to God and ask him what to do in battle. So generations have applied the wisdom from many accounts in the Bible to their own lives. 
However, many have questioned whether the settings and history found in biblical accounts can be trusted evidence and are grounded in the real world. What follows is a brief review of the passage and an example of how relying on the trustworthiness of this account enabled the British forces to conquer the area that was a stronghold for the Ottoman Turks by mimicking a battle plan as told in the first book of Samuel. The Philistines were camped in the deep valley west of Jericho around the town of Mishmash. When Israel's king saw with his army saw their great numbers, they knew they were in trouble. Impatient for the prophet Samuel to arrive to make an offering and pray, many Israelites scatter and hide in caves. In desperation, Saul takes it upon himself to offer what was for him an unauthorized sacrifice, and when Samuel does finally arrive, he predicts that the kingdom will be torn in half and given to another man. After Samuel departs, Saul sees that only 600 people remained with him. The Philistines, however, had assembled 30,000 chariots and 6,000 horsemen and troops. The biblical account tells us that Jonathan, Saul's son, decides to do something daring. He climbs with his armor bearer amongst the steep cliffs and craggy rocks called Senna and Bozes, other than going around. When a squad of enemy lookouts saw them, the Philistines called for them to come up. And then Jonathan said, Behold, we will cross over to the men, and we will show ourselves to them. If they say to us, Wait until we come to you, then we will stand still in our place, and we will not go up to them. But if, if they say, Come up to us, then we will go up, for the Lord has given them into our hand, and this shall be the sign to us. Jonathan, seeing this as a sign that the Lord was with them, went up and over through the Philistines, throwing their army into panic and confusion, ultimately giving the Israelites the victory because they were confused and they started fighting each other and killing each other. Then Jonathan climbed upon his hands and feet and his armor bearer after him, and they fell before Jonathan and his armor bearer killed them after him. And that first strike which Jonathan and his armor bearer made killed about 20 men within as it were a half a furrow's length in an acre of land. And there was a panic in the camp, in the field, and among all the people. The garrison and even the raiders trembled, but the earth quaked, and it became a very great panic. And then history repeated itself. Fast forward to General Allenby's troops. In 1918, towards the end of the First World War, the British planned an attack in an area known as Mishmash. The Turks were entrenched in the same valley that the Philistines had been 3,000 years earlier. Boy, that's really a coincidence. One of the British majors, Vivian Gilbert, thought the name Mishmash sounded familiar. Searching passages in one of the recently purchased Bibles, he found it and reported to his commanding officer. An excerpt from the historical account in the Romance of the Last Crusade, pages 185 through 6, tell us, And the major read on how Jonathan went through the pass, or passage of Mishmash, between Bozes and Seneth, and climbed the hill, dragging his armor bearer with him until they came to a place high up about half an acre of land which a yoke of oxen might plow and the Philistines who were sleeping awoke thought they were surrounded by armies of Saul and fled in disorder and chaos and the multitudes melted away Saul then attacked with his whole army it was a great victory for him his first against the Philistines, and so the Lord saved Israel that day, and the battle passed over to Beth Aven. The brigade major thought to himself, this pass, these rocky headlands, and flat piece of ground are probably still there. Very little has changed in Palestine throughout the centuries. And he awoke the brigadier. Together they read the story over again. The general sent out scouts, who came back and reported finding the pass, thinly held by the Turks, in a rocky crags on either side, obviously, Bozes and Seneth, whilst in the distance, high up in Mishmash, the moonlight was shining on a flat piece of ground just big enough for a team to plow. 
The general decided then and there to change the plan of attack, and instead of the whole brigade, one infantry company alone advanced at dead of night. Along the pass of Mishmash, a few Turks met there, silently dealt with. We passed between Bozes and Seneth, climbed the hillside, and just before dawn found ourselves on the flat piece of ground. The Turks who were sleeping awoke, thought they were surrounded by the armies of Allenby, and fled in chaos and disorder. Order. We killed or captured every Turk that night in Mishmash, so that after thousands of years the tactics of Saul and Jonathan were repeated with success by a British force. If Major Gilbert had not recalled the biblical text, the battle may have ended quite differently. The British army was able to study the terrain and the description in the Bible to know that this mishmash that they were about to descend on was the same as the one described in 1 Samuel. The accounts in the Bible were rooted in reality. So, what is notable is that these soldiers put so much trust in the details of a 3,000 year old narrative and it appears that their trust was well placed and paid off because the exact same incidents were repeated 3,000 years later. British General Allen B's army. Jerusalem is the place where it started in creation and it's the place where it will end. So, and when I say end, I mean the kingdoms of this world will cease and then God will be reigning forever from Jerusalem but God's going to have to cleanse the place through a type of destruction of some sort because the temple will be defiled by the Antichrist. So God had his exact moment for the liberation of the Holy Land in 1917 to create the Jewish nation, the state of Israel, after 400 years of Muslim Ottoman Turkish occupation. Now the Muslims are still there on God's holy mountain and the Jews are trying to get equal rights to be able to pray there. And this is why I'm telling you I truly believe when they said that the Messiah, the anointed one, is somebody they're going to see just like a Moses that was like a redeemer or Boaz that was like a redeemer and they'll see another man as a redeemer or as a um, a man that that assists them in whatever they are trying to accomplish as a nation so with the king over the them as they join the commonwealth this would just culminate in everything uh, with Israel just recognizing that God had a hand in 1917 for that liberation and the prophecy in Haggai and it's just incredible and it's incredible that the Christian figured it out from you know the Leviticus curse for Israel going into apostasy and having it be a sevenfold punishment so he pinpointed it to that date and it is incredible that God has a date for the rapture he has a time and a moment in time where this king is going to restore the Davidic dynasty and then the Lord is going to come and take the throne and he's going to judge his people I know people think everything is on the up and up with Israel but it isn't there's this antichrist element that this there on the Temple Mount so there's a lot of apostasy that's going on right now and when the all the world religions come together as one and they come right there to Jerusalem Jerusalem will be mystery Babylon once again um, playing the scarlet harlot and having idols that are brought in now it's really incredible that the Lord is just really fast forwarding things and we know that we are on the cusp of eternity any time now 
you know, a lot has come to pass and is still coming to pass. And we've just seen the power of God in these events that were miraculous. And also, it was no coincidence that, um, you know, I believe it was Robert Breaker that had said that Abraham was born in 1948 and Israel was born as a nation in one hour in 1948. So those things are no coincidence, just like those events were no coincidence. God had a specific day, time, and year, and a certain amount of years had had to pass for the fulfillment to come. Now, considering that Queen Elizabeth II was the longest reigning queen, and most monarchs don't make it to reign for 70 years, but she did, and 70 is such a significant number to the Lord until, you know, King Charles III was born in 1948, the same year that Israel became a nation, and it's going to end with him sitting on their throne of David. I truly believe this is how it's going to happen. So he's born in 1948, and that's why it's not going to be William or Harry or what other people try to throw in their theory. But Charles is the one, and of course we know all the other things that's associated with him. But I'm just saying that these dates are um, unbelievable. Tell me how it is that the Queen reigned the longest of any monarch on the British throne for 70 years, and her son is waiting in the wings to become king, and you know, setting up all of his agenda. And then right when the queen dies, it's the end of 70 years reign, and he takes over the throne, and he's rushing to make his mark. <laughs> and it's just incredible. And there's this seven-year trade deal, and then when they have the red heifer sacrifice, the rabbis plan to have him there either performing it or assisting with it. And that will be the start of the sacrificial system that will allow for the third temple to be built. And this will be the covenant with many. I truly believe it. So it will be the sprinkling of the children of Israel with these ashes of the red heifer and the water from the pool of Siloam. That will be the covenant with many. So that will start the Antichrist you know will be there and take his seat in the third temple but the Lord is going to destroy those things that are defiled so those of you who are thinking that everything's going to be copacetic when the third temple comes I have a rude awakening for you you know God is going to judge them for not only rejecting him as king of kings you know as their Messiah but they're going to kill the two witnesses because they are they have the antichrist spirit the anti-gospel which is the testimony of God so that's the antichrist spirit that they have there so it is mystery Babylon the mother of harlots and Jerusalem the mother of us all and I'm going to keep repeating this as long as I have to as long as people keep taking my words and flipping it and twisting it into something that it isn't from the Holy Spirit when they're speaking it. So it's scriptural what I'm saying. Scripture against scripture. So the Lord is coming. His word is true. He is exact to an exact moment in time. And that's when the rapture will happen. And we need to just pay attention all the time to all of these events. But I wanted to tell you the miracles that took place and how the British were involved and how this could cause Israel to remember that by the hand of God they were delivered in Jerusalem by the British army. And then later on there was fighting with the British and all of that. So this is how they could admire King Charles III and put him on the throne 
on top of all the other things that I've just stated and said in prior videos. So anyway, uh, that's all for now. I'll talk to you later. Hope you enjoyed this segment. And um, like, subscribe, and share. And please support my channel. Um, it's very critical. And I thank you so much. And I will just leave the address uh, for giving a donation and for if you want to read the book that the Lord gave me, Divine Revelations about Jesus for the last days, it's from OlivePressPublisher.com and it's The Almond Tree, Aaron's Rod, The Messiah, King of Israel. So by Kimberly K. Ballard. So I'll see you later. I hope you enjoyed this. Good night.